This is Pastor Nick Hood. We'll be starting worship in just a minute. This Sunday I'm preaching on a powerful topic, which is simply this. I call it Decision Day. And what I mean by that is in life, all of our lives, we make decisions. Do I believe my parents? Do I not believe my parents? Do I decide to study in school? Do I decide not to study in school? Do I decide to goof off, get uh, involved in drugs, or do I make a choice? I don't want to do that. The athletes in high school, when they get ready to pick a college, it, they make a commitment and uh, they sign a commitment letter. It is a decision. But you know, there are a lot of decisions in life. Uh, do I buy chicken, fish, or steak at the store? Uh, yeah, that's one level of decision. Do I decide that I'm going to be a vegetarian or not? But a much bigger decision is this. Have I made a decision to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior? Have I made a decision to make the Lord foremost in my life? That's what I'm preaching about today. If you want to get a preview of the sermon, go to Acts 16, around verse 24. This is where the Apostle Paul and Silas are arrested in Philippi uh, for, you know, they converted a slave girl who uh, had the gift of sorcery. And uh, once they converted her to Jesus Christ, she stopped giving out prophecy. So you can imagine how upset her owners were. So Paul and Silas get thrown into jail. And while they're in jail, an earthquake comes. And in the middle of the night, they are singing and praying to God and uh, they tell all the prisoners, stay in your cell, don't run. Uh, and uh, the jailer is so impressed that Paul was able to, you know, help and encourage the other prisoners not to run away. Uh, he was prepared to kill himself. He takes Paul and Silas to his home. Uh, he bathes the wounds that he either self-inflicted on them or wounds that he gave the order for other people to whip them. Uh, he ba personally bathes their wounds. And then he talks to Paul and Silas about what must I do to be saved? And they told him, you've got to give your life to Jesus Christ. And at that point, he is baptized along with everybody else in his family. Uh, and that man's life is forever changed. And so that's what I'm preaching about today, decision day. Have you made a decision for the Lord? And uh, we'll be starting worship in just a moment. church. Good morning, people. Today is the day that the Lord has made us rejoice and be glad in it. The highest praise is holiday, holiday, hallelujah. Wherever you are, join us and sing today. Lift up your voices because the most high are in Lord. He deserves all the praise and worship. He woke you up this morning. And he's starting on your way. We got a lot to be grateful today about. So join us as we sing today. Here we go. The Lord is high above the heavens. The Lord is high above the heavens. And his glory above the nation. And his glory above the nation. The Lord is high above the heavens. The Lord is high above the heavens. And his glory above the nation. And his glory above the nation. Oh, the Lord is high. 
high above the heavens. The Lord is high above the heavens. And his glory above the nation. And his glory above the nation. The Lord is high above the heavens. The Lord is high above the nation. And his glory above the nation. And his glory above the nation. Give God the highest praise. Acknowledge him always. And all the people say, Hallelujah.
today, I invite you to join uh, along with me in reading the United Church of Christ Statement of Faith. <clears throat> we believe in God, the Eternal Spirit, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and our Father, and to his deeds we testify. He calls the world into being, creates man in his own image, and sets before him the ways of life and death. He seeks in holy love 
to serve all people from aimlessness and sin. He judges men and nations by his righteous will, declared through prophets and apostles. In Jesus Christ, the man of Nazareth, our crucified and risen Lord, he has come to us and shared our common lot, conquering sin and death and reconciling the world to himself. He bestows upon us his Holy Spirit, creating and renewing the Church of Jesus Christ, binding in covenant faithful people of all ages, tongues, and races. He calls us into his church to accept the cause and joy of discipleship, to be his servants in the service of men, to proclaim the gospel to all the world and resist the powers of evil, to share in Christ's baptism and eat at his table, to join him in his passion and victory. He promises to all who trust him forgiveness of sins and fullness of grace, courage in the struggle for justice and peace, his presence in trial and rejoicing, and eternal life in his kingdom which has no end. Blessing and honor, glory and power be unto him. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son. Welcome to the Plymouth United Church of Christ, located in the heart of Detroit, the very tip top of the medical center area of Detroit. We are praising God in the midst of a pandemic, and I want to thank each of you for watching us, worshiping with us today. I hope you uh, text your neighbor, text your friend, tell them to tune in uh, to the Plymouth United Church of Christ, Detroit. We're coming to you live on Facebook streaming but also on the church website, Plymouth United Church of Christ, Detroit. I want to thank those of you who are, have supported the church, who are supporting the church. I walked in this morning, and uh, we had a door full of envelopes. And I just, each of these envelopes represents support of the church. And perhaps there's someone here today who is looking at the church worship service from you belong to another church. And I want you to know that that's okay. It's okay to belong to another church. But if your church has ever done anything good for you, if your pastor has ever said a word that encouraged you, uh, if your church has supported you the way, you know, our church supports people, uh, your church supports people, if your church has ever supported you or anybody, the poor, the hungry, the tired, Today ought to be a day that you write a check to the church. And if you can't write a check, uh, go to the Cash App. We just uh, instituted Cash App for our church, and I hate to admit that I'm behind the times, but uh, so many people have been asking me about Cash App and when are you going to start the Cash App. And so we're finally on board with the Cash App, and I thank you. But however you support your church, Today ought to be a day, a day, a day when you step up and say, I'm not going to let my church go under because of the pandemic. I invite you to join with us now in prayer. Uh, Jesus taught us that when we pray, that we should not stand on a crowded street corner, lifting up vain and empty repetition, but rather when we pray, that we should steal away to our prayer closet, pray to our Father in heaven who hears and sees in secret, and God will reward you. So ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door will be opened unto you. Uh, Brother Lamar, what is our prayer hymn today? Jesus, keep me near the cross. Hmm? 
Jesus, keep me near the cross. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There is a precious fountain. And as we sing this hymn, I want you to focus your mind on what you want to share with God. Let us listen to the sweet sounds of this prayer hymn. Let us pray. Let's sing this together. Jesus, Don't want to accept the illness 
that is ravaging their body. Oh Lord God, we pray right now for the couple of people, the married and the unmarried, that we might learn a more perfect way to love one another, that we might learn a more perfect way to listen, to laugh, to be tender to one another. Oh Lord God, guard our tongues so that we might think about what we utter before we say a word. We pray today for the single people and we pray that in our singleness that we might find a pathway to wholeness. Oh Lord God, we pray right now for our children that our children might have the best lives possible. We pray, oh Lord God, that our children might accept good discipline. We pray that our children might be filled with good dreams and ambition of what they'd like to do with their lives. Oh Lord God, we pray right now for the person in this pandemic who does not have enough money. We pray for those who economically are challenged cannot do what they used to do, cannot work the way they used to work, cannot thrive the way they used to thrive. But, oh Lord God, we pray that you might show us a way to prosperity, even in a pandemic. Oh Lord God, we pray right now for this nation. We pray for the world. We pray for every person, oh Lord God, who's challenged. We pray, O oh Lord God, for the nations of the world that are tottering on war. Show us, O oh Lord God, the pathway to peace, the pathway to understanding. There's somebody today, O oh Lord God, in prayer trying to figure out retirement. There's some young person trying to figure out how to move forward. Oh Lord God, we pray that you might help us. Help us to live the most productive lives we can possibly lead. And then lead us into thy salvation. When we've done it all, cannot do anything more. We ask just one final blessing. Lay us gently to sleep. Take away the life we've come to know, the love we've come to cherish. And on that last day, redeem us of our sins. Grant us life everlasting in that glorious kingdom which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, our rock and redeemer, we pray. Amen. to the Plymouth United Church of Christ, located in the heart of Detroit. I want to thank our worship team, uh, Dr. Ella Davis, who led us in the Statement of Faith. I want to thank our musicians, led by our Minister of Music, Lamar Willis, on the piano. We have Ibrahim Jones on the bass, Jason Johnson on the drums. We have Marcus Skinner on the keyboard and Jerome Clark on the guitar. We also have singing with us today, Walter Rushing. Say amen. And uh, we have also with us singing and playing on the organ, Sheila Odin, the representative woman. Amen. And I want you to know something, Sheila, you are no token. Amen. You are not here because you are a token. 
uh, you are holding your own. I want to thank Rita White in the back, who is uh, controlling our video. I want to thank Steve Bostick, who's controlling the sight and the sound. We have Mike Daniels, who's with us, uh, and he's helping everything. Amen. And uh, I tell you something uh, about this shirt that I'm wearing. I got this shirt along with most of those other shirts you've seen me wear this summer, the traditional African shirts from Liberia. Some are from Sierra Leone and some other places, but mainly they're in Liberia. This one was given in 2013 in Liberia. Every church I preached at gave me a church, and I, uh, gave me a shirt. I want to thank Franklin uh, uh, Wea Toure. Uh, who's watching this all the way from Liberia. That's very humbling to me. And Sister Jacqueline, I want to thank you. But uh, a few years ago, I was flying back from California to see my grandchildren, and I had a dream. And in the dream, uh, Walter and Sheila, you're not going to believe this, but I dreamed that you all were with me in Africa. You were in Liberia, and uh, where I got this shirt. And, uh, you know, for balance, uh, the dream had Maxine in it, your wife, and Shanithia. Now, I haven't seen Shanithia in a while since, I haven't seen her since the pandemic. But in the dream, we were going all throughout uh, an area of Liberia called River G, and we were going through the Monrovia area, and you all were singing. And it was an amazing thing, and you were playing. And so, you know, it just dawned on me today, I said, half my dream is here, right here. And uh, it's not that I don't like the rest of you guys. Uh, I just couldn't imagine you traveling uh, that far. <laughs> but uh, I thank you for being here today. I love your music, and uh, it is absolutely enthralling to me. Uh, Brother Walter, I don't want to put you on the spot, but this is the moment. If you'd like to sing a song, you're welcome. If not, we can wait till next week. So, so you have a song? Okay. Well, I tell you what, I want everybody to see you, so why don't you stand up, just lift the microphone up, and uh, to those of you who don't know him, we are going to be treated now by Brother Walter Russian. Amen. <clears throat> Though the storm Keep raging in my life And sometimes it's hard To tell the night from day Still that hope that lies within Is real As I keep my eye upon the distant shore, I know he'll lead me safely to that special place he has prepared. And
keep raging in my life and sometimes it's hard to tell the night from day still that hope that lies within is reassured As I keep my eye upon the distant shore, I know he'll lead me safely through that special place he has prepared. But myself together, if you will. Uh, I just sometimes play to put myself in a spiritual zone.
gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house, gathered in his name to worship Christ the Lord. Worship him, Christ the Lord. So forget about yourself. So forget about yourself. Concentrate on Him and worship Him. So forget about yourself. Concentrate on Him and worship Him. So forget about yourself. Concentrate on Him and worship Christ the Lord.
16th chapter, beginning at the 25th verse. I want you to bear with me. You may be able to see the scripture on the screen with you, but it reads, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was an earthquake, so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, since he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. The jailer called for lights, and rushing in, he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They answered, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in his house. At the same hour of the night, he took them and washed their wounds. Then he and his entire family were baptized without delay. He brought them up into the house and set food before them, and he and his entire household rejoiced that he had become a believer in God. Decision Day. I want to thought, talk with you for a few moments about making a decision, and the importance of making decisions in life. Every decision is important. When I wake up, do I brush my teeth? Do I bathe? Do I, as a child, follow the instruction of my parents? Do I study in school? The decision whether or not to daydream in school, they're all choices. The decision to talk about somebody else and make jokes about somebody else in a demeaning kind of way, that is a choice. A decision to follow Jesus is a commitment. When the high school athlete decides on what college they will attend, they sign a letter of commitment. The rookie pro athlete is drafted by a professional team but the commitment is sealed with the signing of a contract. A student applies to college, uh, to graduate school, to medical school, to nursing school, but at some point must make a commitment. It's one thing to apply, it is another thing to commit. A young person joins the Army, and at some point they make a commitment, they sign up. Men and women fall in love and decide to get married. They make a commitment, for better or for worse, for richer or for poor, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish till death do us part. That is a commitment. The musician reads a score of notes, but before they put the horn to the lips, the finger to the keys of the piano, the fingers to the strings of a violin, cello or bass, viola, at some point they make a commitment. And when they make a commitment, they commit that I am going to play the notes on this page the way they're written. No different 
no more, no less. It is a commitment. One of the main components of success is commitment. And if a person cannot find something to commit to, I doubt that they will be very successful. For eight years, I served as an elected member of the Detroit City Council, citywide. It didn't seem that big a deal in 1993 when I got elected, but I look at the councilmen now, they represent districts. I think you can win a council seat for what? 10,000 or less votes. You know, we had to have 90,000 or something. You know, and so it is a different ball game. And, uh, but one of the things, as I think back to that period, uh, the elected part serving was from 94 to 2001. And one of the things I remember that I really enjoyed most was Wednesdays at 11.30. You might say, why Wednesdays at 11.30? So because that was the formal vote. Now, all week long, there are these little votes uh, to decide what's going to be on the agenda, what's not. But the real deal, when the pedal hit the metal, was Wednesdays at 11.30. And I like Wednesdays at 11.30 because what I'd learned in that eight years of being on a council was that so often, council members would jawbone, you know, during the week. Uh, very often, it was not unusual to hear a councilman sometimes be very impassioned about an issue. But on other occasions, they would say, well, I don't really have a strong feeling about this. And would let you believe that maybe they could go to the right or go to the left uh, and delay the criticism that might come for whatever vote you would make. But Wednesdays at 11.30, you had to show yourself for what you were. And I liked that. I liked it. I said, because for this one little sliver of time, each of the nine of us who are sitting around this table have to stand up for what we believe. And you know, so often in life, people don't want to stand for what they believe. They want to duck and hide, slip and glide, and fool you and make you think that they're with you when they really aren't. But when you're in an elected body uh, that has to vote, uh, you find that you cannot pretend the vote is in writing. And I got to the point where not only would I, you know, vote my conscience, but I would write down why I vote what I voted on. And if you go back to the journal of the Detroit City Council between 1994 and 2001, you'll see a lot of statements uh, that I wrote defining why I voted a certain way. Because I said, years will be passed. People won't know even who we were. Uh, on that, those two particular councils. I said, but you know what? Uh, if they take the time to read the written account, somebody will see and know and understand what my mindset was, that I made a commitment. And one of the main components of success is commitment. The national, state, and local elections that we just went through uh, on a primary scale and in November will be the, the formal final vote uh, will provide the people an opportunity, the people of the nation, an opportunity to shape and define the direction of the country. Will we be progressive? Will we be regressive? Will we be positive? Will we be negative? We will, will we, as a nation, attempt to address racism? Or will we, as a nation, continue to duck and hide, slip and glide, and hope that nobody knows where we really stand? Over the course of one's lifetime, you and I will make a number of commitments. But as far as I'm concerned, there's no commitment greater than the commitment to Jesus Christ. And you might ask, why is the commitment to Jesus Christ so significant? Because unlike a vote at the city council, unlike a decision to cut the grass or, or shovel the snow, uh, a decision for Jesus Christ is for eternity. Where do you want to be in eternity? And that is the significance of deciding Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Uh, the Bible is full of examples of people who chose, they made a decision for Christ. You have the disciples, you know, Peter, James, John, Andrew, Thaddeus, uh, all of them, uh, Judas, they all made a decision to follow Christ. 
You had strangers who followed Christ, sick people who followed Christ, uh, and others. But today, I want to talk about one of those people who followed Christ. He happened to be a man who never met Jesus. We don't even know his name. All we know is that he was a jailer in a city called Philippi. And Philippi is significant because it was at Philippi where a woman named Lydia, your namesake, where Lydia uh, accepted Jesus. She's the first Christian convert. She got down in the river at Philippi and Paul baptized her in the name of Jesus Christ. Lydia was so moved by being baptized and committing her life to Christ, the Bible tells us she and her household gave their lives to Christ. They were all baptized. Lydia was an independent woman, an independent merchant who sold purple. She was from the city of Tyratira. Well, you have Lydia, who is baptized in the river in Philippi. I've been to that river. I put my feet in the river. I had to put my feet in the river because I said, I want to see where Lydia went down. And, but later, in the book of Acts, in the 16th chapter, we have another incident that happens at Philippi. There's an unknown jailer. We don't know his name. We know Lydia's name. The jailer, we don't really know. All we know is that Paul and Silas were arrested. They were arrested because they converted a slave woman. The slave woman had the gift of divination. And she would go around uh, for her masters and make them money. She could tell the future. And when that woman met Paul and Silas, she gave her life to Jesus Christ and she stopped divining. Well, you can imagine it's one thing for the salvation of her soul, but her masters didn't like it because their revenue stream was disrupted. So they went to the authorities. They said, arrest these men because they have messed up our money. And the local jailers arrested Paul and Silas. They are in jail, and around midnight, the Bible tells us in the 16th chapter that Paul and Silas are praying and singing hymns to God. They are in the jail. The other prisoners are listening to them hymn, sing, and pray. And around midnight, an earthquake happens. An earthquake happens at Philippi. It messes up the ground. It rattles the prison. The doors are flung wide open. The jailer is asleep, wakes up. And when he wakes up, He's afraid that he's a dead man because he says all these prisoners are going to escape. The Bible tells us that he pulled his sword out. He's ready to kill himself. And Paul yells out to him, don't hurt yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer can't believe it. And so he calls for Paul and Silas to come to him. They come to him. And when they come to him, the jailer says, what must I do to be saved? And they look at him and they say, you can be saved if you give your life to Jesus Christ. That's all you have to do. Give your life to Jesus Christ. And the jailer takes them home. He takes them home and at his house, the jailer uh, learns more about Jesus. Yeah, my microphone's going in and out. He learns more about Jesus. And they tell him, Paul and Silas tell him about this man, Jesus. And uh, he, the man says, I want to be baptized. And they baptize him and his wife and children right there at their house. They are baptized. I don't know if they were near the river. I don't know if he just got a little bit of water and put it on their heads, but he baptized them. Then the Bible tells us that Paul and Silas told the jailer more about Jesus and, and what life with Jesus is like. And then the Bible tells us that the wife and the children of the jailer rejoice because the jailer gave his life to Christ. And think about that. They're not rejoicing. It doesn't say they're rejoicing because they gave their lives to Christ. 
they are rejoicing because their dad and husband gave his life to Christ. And for the women in here, uh, women out there who are looking at this, uh, can you imagine why the wife and the children were rejoicing that the jailer gave his life to Christ? We can only imagine. He may have come home and beat his wife. In my imagination, he may have beat his children. Uh, I don't know. Maybe in my imagination, he was a man who was so thoroughly disgusted with being a jailer that when he would come home, he wouldn't talk at all. Who knows? Uh, but imagine how the story would be different if this man had not accepted Jesus Christ. If he had not accepted Jesus Christ, he'd be continuing in his way. If he had not accepted the Lord, he would not have exposed them to Paul and Silas. If he had not accepted Jesus, not only would the dad not, and husband not be baptized, but neither would the wife and the children. And so they are all rejoicing. And then, on top of that, the jailer, according to the 16th chapter of Acts, he bathes the wounds of Paul and Silas. They've been whipped terribly. And he may not have whipped them personally, but he's the man who oversaw the whippings. And so he bathes their back with soothing aloes and, and ointment. And he feeds them at his table. And, you know, Paul and Silas... Uh, after a while, are allowed to go. It's an amazing end to the story. And so the question I want to put to you today is this. What is it that's holding you back from giving your life to Jesus? What's the hold up? What's the procrastination? Is it the fear of what you might have to give up? Are you not making a decision yet for Jesus because you're afraid of what your family and your friends might think, your co-workers might think? You know, people look at you differently if you don't drink. People look at you differently uh, if everybody in the room is smoking dope and you're not there smoking with them. What is the cost of discipleship? And a lot bigger than whether or not you smoke dope or drink. You know, when I think about the progressive movement that's sweeping across the nation right now, if you decide to follow Jesus, it's very, very difficult. It is impossible for you not to stand up for truth and righteousness. And when you start standing up for truth and righteousness, it's one thing to be a black person who says black lives matter. But it's a whole nother ball game if you are white and you say black lives matter. Uh, when you stand up as a white person, I know there's some white people looking at this right now. You stand up as a white person and say, I'm going to stand up for equity and diversity and inclusion. Wherever I am, the minute you start talking with those kind of words, somebody's going to look at you like you've been smoking dope. And so you have to ask yourself, what is the cost and the joy of discipleship? You see, my friends, every day, is decision day. It's not just the day that you accept Christ, but it is every day. Every day, how do I renew the vows of my baptism? Every day, how do I renew my commitment to the Lord? Every day, how do I renew my commitment to justice and truth and peace and mercy? Every day, uh, am I willing to put my life on the line for something that is bigger than myself. Decision day, my friends, is a day when you decide to follow Jesus. But decision day is also a day when we decide to grow in faith. Not just the first decision, but every day of life. Do I only accept the Lord once, or do I accept the Lord day by day by day? I don't know about you, but I find myself in a constant state of growth. I find myself in a constant state of renewal. I find myself every day deciding for Jesus and asking myself, Jesus, what would you have me to do now? Jesus, who do you want me to love? Jesus, how do you want me to show my love? Jesus, show me the words to say. Jesus, show me the things to do. 
Jesus, show me the places to go. And I want to give my life to you. I don't want to hold back. I don't want to sleep through my blessing. I want to live my blessing right now because I don't know when the, the, end, the, the end will come. I don't know when the Lord is going to call me back. And because I don't know when the Lord is going to call me back, I'm saying right now, Jesus, take me. Right now, Lord, shape me. Right now, make me. Right now, lead me. Right now, guide me. Right now, Lord, point me in that way and I will go right now. Whisper in my ear and I will listen right now. Talk to me and I will do right now, right now, right now. God bless you. have faith to receive it. God knows that you need it. I want to thank you so much for worshiping with us this day. If you've enjoyed this worship service, share it with a friend. Create a watch party, even right now. Just have faith to receive it. God knows that you need it. There's a blessing in this house waiting for you. Will you sing the song with us at home? There's a blessing in this house waiting for you. Somebody is ready to receive the blessing of salvation. Make your decision right now. There's a blessing. There's a blessing in this house. And it's waiting for you. There's a blessing waiting for you. Yes, it is. There's a blessing in this house, and, and it's waiting for you. Just have faith. multiple sclerosis, but there's there healing. Is there is healing in this house and it's waiting for you. I'm praying right now for the person with cancer, the coronavirus. There is healing in this house and it's waiting for you. You may have diabetes, but just have faith. Just have faith to receive it. God knows. God knows that you need it. There's a blessing in this house, and it's waiting for you. Last verse. There's love. I love you.
unto you. Lift up the light of his countenance upon you. Grant you peace, both now and forever and evermore. God bless. There's a blessing
And I'd like to bring that to the attention because she's been subject to 44 years of abuse. <laughs> so we want to acknowledge Denise for putting up with this for 44 years and congratulate you, Reverend Hood. And congratulate you too, Reverend. Thank you, everyone. See you next Sunday.